it's 5.30, so it's time uh, to start our um, thematic uh, session. Welcome, everybody. Buon pomeriggio a tutti. And it's an honor and a pleasure to start uh, our session. Um, my name is Marco Ventura. I'm a law professor at the University of Siena, and uh, I have the privilege to chair, along with uh, Pasquale Annichino, this uh, session. Um, well, the four of us, we are here. Uh, we also have three speakers online, and uh, we will introduce them in a short uh, uh, while. Um, we have uh, uh, organized a, a, a schedule which is meant to keep uh, our dialogue and conversation as lively as possible with very short interventions from each of us. This is also meant to uh, invite, encourage, enable the attendants to step in with whatever observations or questions or remarks uh, that might come to your mind. So feel encouraged from the very beginning in, in this regard. Um, the, um, the session is linked to the work of one of the working groups of the G20 Interfaith Forum. Uh, the working group on uh, research and innovation uh, in science and technology. Um, the members are here today, uh, although the, the, our panel goes beyond, of course, the members of, of the group, but uh, the one who will uh, open uh, our session with his remarks is, is James uh, Christie. James has been one of the initiator of the process of the, the G20 interfaith, I'm sure he will, he will mention this, and uh, he's the, 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 the most, um, uh, um, the, 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 the better placed person to actually start. James uh, uh, is also a member of the advisory board of the G20 interfaith. James, you have uh, the floor for your initial remarks. Vi ringrazio, professore Ventura. Benvenuto a tutti i mondi, i cari amici, and as Dr. Ventura has said, it is my distinct pleasure and privilege to be able to officially welcome you to this hybrid session of the uh, Interfaith 20 uh, meetings in Bologna, convened through the good offices of Fischeri, who is which is coordinating this particular uh, conversation today. I speak to you this morning uh, or this evening or uh, this afternoon or during the night, wherever you may be from Ottawa, the capital city of Canada, and have but a couple of observations to make as we begin. The first is that there are so many people who are implicated in pulling together this particular event, this um, conversation, inclusive conversation globally on artificial intelligence that it would be impossible for me to name them within the brief time restraints that I have. So I will simply use that old and trusted diplomatic phrase, all courtesies are observed and trust that that will suffice for the moment. I would of course be remiss if I did not mention specific thanks to my three colleagues, Dr. Ventura, Dr. Marianne, and Dr. Garacci, however, whose tireless work over the last year has made that which we will present to you today possible. Having said that, I, I would call to your mind that in 1961, six decades ago, then Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru opened the what was Salon Academy of Science by observing that the time has passed for politics and religion, the time has come for science and spirituality. He may not have been entirely prescient, but aspirationally his remarks were significant at the time and remain significant now. Half a century later, nearly, the eminent American physicist and British American physicist Freeman Dyson observed in the Jerusalem Harvard lectures that two voices speak to the future of humanity. One is the voice of science, the other is the voice of religion. And in this particular conversation today, we wish to ensure that those two voices engage, representing what Jay Gould uh, has famously observed are two discrete and non-overlapping 
um, magisterium. The concern of the first, the G8 Interfaith Forum and its success of the G20 Interfaith Forum has been ever to bring into conversation a variety of disciplines under the rubric of engaging the political and economic sphere of first the G8 and then the G20 with the religious sphere, sphere worldwide. And the Rosetta Stone, which we first employed was that of the Millennium Development Goals established during Kofi Annan's Millennium Forum in 2000. That Rosetta Stone has been somewhat expanded now to include the full 17 sustainable development goals, including the one, of course, on science and uh, technology, innovation and infrastructure. And this is the work, the harvest of the work of this particular group and conversation during the better part of uh, the last year. In the conversation, one thing has been confirmed to us time and time again within the working group and within the broader context of the interfaith, G20 Interfaith Forum. And that is that science and religion have one overarching question that we hold in common. And that overarching question is, what does it mean to be human? And the implications of artificial intelligence, both for the magisteria of science and the magisterium of religion are, we believe, self-evident and worthy of exploration. We thank you for being with us today as we engage precisely in that exploration, the culmination of nearly a year and a half's work and engagement, and yet still only the very beginning of where we anticipate going. We trust and hope that you will enjoy this particular um, panel, that you will engage in it as fully as the media where you are or in person may permit. And we look forward to further engagement with you over many years to come as evolution in our respective disciplines continues to unfold. All the very best and thank you again for being with us. Back to thank you, thank you. Th thank you, James, thank you very much for these opening remarks. I hope the sound is, is, is fine in the room down to the, 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 the far end, uh, you, ca you can hear well? Good. Um, so um, we're ready to start with a um, short uh, presentation of the panelists by Pasquale Anichino, then a first uh, very quick round uh, from four of us about their position on the topic. Pasquale Anichino, you have the floor. Thank you. Okay, I hope you can hear me well. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I was introduced already by Professor Ventura. Uh, I have to say that it's, I'm very interested in this topic, uh, being a low religion scholar, but with a deep interest in uh, technology and AI. And in fact, one of the classes that I will teach the, this uh, year is on uh, ethics and regulation of AI. So because I think that, uh, as uh, James said before, we are all looking forward to the answer, what does it mean to be human today? with the approach and uh, the, the role that AI is playing in our society. And this is why I look forward to hear from our distinguished speaker today. So, Professor Ventura, you know him, Professor of Law and Religion, University of Siena, and the Director of the Center for Religious Studies at FPK. Uh, we have already heard from uh, uh, James Christie, which is the ambassador at large of the Candida Multifaith Federation. And then we will have uh, uh, other speakers. So, in the order they are listed, uh, professor Robert Geraci, which is Professor of Religious Studies at Manhattan College in New York City. Robert is online and we will hear from him. Branca Marian, Senior Researcher at the Project Plug Shares, and Branca is also online. Then we have uh, present here in the room uh, Alessio Pecorario, which is the Coordinator of the Security Task Force of the Vatican COVID-19 Commission. And then we have uh, Susanna Trotta, which is a researcher at FPK and research advisor at the Joint Learning Initiative on Faith and Local Communities. And so without further ado, I'm very happy to give and to kick off the first round of intervention of three minutes each for the speakers. We start from Professor Geraci. Robert, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. I trust that I will come through okay, despite having foolishly left at home headphones and microphone and anything that might have been useful toward this purpose. Uh, my work is at the intersection of religion, science and technology, and often with regard to AI, I am particularly interested in 
the narratives about AI. And I think that we all need to be at least aware of, if not interested in narratives about AI, because some of those narratives which happen at this intersection of with religion, you know, there are secular narratives, there are explicitly religious narratives. For example, how would we use a robot in, in a religious service or something? And then there are implicitly religious kinds of narratives where people talk, for example, about the future of humanity, uploading their minds into robots and that sort of thing. So I am particularly interested in how those narratives intersect with one another and how it is that we might engage with them. Religious communities, of course, recognize the significance of narratives, whether in text, in tradition, or community action, narratives frame our religious worlds. They're absolutely vital to the way in which we see and understand ourselves. So the narratives about AI, they very much matter. We very frequently see narratives of disaster, that is Terminator scenarios, the machines that take over the world, or they decide to kill all of the people and these scenarios are deliberate or accidental and it hardly matters because either way human beings lose. And then we see narratives that promise salvation where AI will solve all of the, the problems that human beings face from energy development to uh, climate change. And it's one thing that I think is funny about these narratives is that we share in common our concerns about disaster but our paradises have a tendency to compete with one another across those secular and explicitly religious and implicitly religious groups. So maybe that says something about how to talk with one another, what we must, that, that we must talk together um, to what we want to avoid rather than trying to force upon one another something we see as the plan for the future. So I suggest that we familiarize ourselves with one another's stories, find ways of thinking about how AI fits into them, and turn to our shared resources in ways that will allow us to build a global narrative for AI in our religious context. Thank you. Many thanks, Robert. I will go back to what you said before when I will have time for comments because you raised a very interesting point. Uh, but now it's my duty to give the floor to Branka Marianne for the second intervention. Branka, you have the floor. Thank you so much, everyone. It would be so nice to be there in person with you, and we hope that that will be po become possible at some point uh, soon. So like Robert, I'm really interested in sort of the narratives that emerge around artificial intelligence, but I'm particularly focused on uh, military and security applications. And subsequently, I will speak about the weaponization of AI and some of our findings. But I very much, I guess, Robert, live in those dystopian uh, narratives because so much of that concern, um, you know, went from even a few years ago being something that you might have seen in a movie or a science fiction novel to really actual research and work that's being pursued by militaries. And there is this sort of background of a growing global competition over the use of artificial intelligence by sort of leading uh, militaries which is, I think, pushing us in, in the direction of possibly having systems that are nowhere near ready or you know, that, that really shouldn't be used or deployed um, becoming sort of options. And so that kind of challenge um, is something that has received some attention at the international level, but deserves much greater attention than we've been giving it. Really, it is actually quite surprising how um, such scenarios, I think for most people tend to still be something that they think are quite distant or at least don't impact them directly. And what has really come across this discussion that we've had is that sort of weaponization of artificial intelligence in various ways impacts all of us um, and, and of course international stability and those kinds of concerns have been discussed at the United Nations um, and are something that we would like to see sort of responses to. So in, in the kind of advocacy work that I do and the research that I've done, what has become really clear is this need for a multi-level, multi-governance approach. You know, a single treaty or a single way, you know, a single code of conduct won't sort of address the numerous issues that exist because artificial intelligence is a multi-use technology. There's so many particular uses uh, for this technology. So we need to work together and have a much more inclusive dialogue. And that's where faith 
and belief communities come in. That's where civil society organizations and, you know, technical technical experts and governments, the, we need these voices to be at the table. So sort of widening that governance discussion will absolutely be necessary because the tools are becoming much more available to a variety of actors. And I think that's fascinating, but it's also really challenging from an international security perspective, because you have to now think about a variety of actors having those tools at their disposal. So I'll leave it there because I'll come back to the weaponization of AI, just to say I appreciate this dialogue. And I think it's really a part of uh, governance response that we are seeing that we need. Thank you. Many thanks, Branka, also for keeping the time. Uh, so now we hear from uh, one of the voices that we want at the table to discuss this, and uh, I'm very happy to give the floor to Alessio Pecoraro. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I think uh, to start with that, uh, the title of this panel is very pertinent, especially when it uh, defines technology as a revolution. Technology is so pervasive, uh, radical, and incessant that it's assuming almost the features of a new divinity, um, which is separated from us and almost control us uh, in a sort of paradox if we only think that science uh, was uh, supposed to be a tool that to improve the, 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 human, the, the life of the humans in their daily and social life. But technology is, is, is a true revolution from both angles that we are normally used to conceive revolution. First of all, is a, a new order on the spirit, and that is why we discuss today not only with scientists and experts, but also with religions, traditions, uh, and political decision makers. But it's also the collapse or the overthrow of, the, of an old legality, maybe the establishment of a new, of a new order. Being no different in that regard from previous revolutions that happened in the past, especially in modern age, and that have been identified as a separation, a loss of centrality of humanity. Uh, to be more clear, for example, very easily with Copernicus, we find out that humans, as uh, the Earth and the humans with it, are not any longer the center of the universe. With uh, Charles Darwin, we find out that uh, human beings uh, are not any longer the center of the species, but just as species, like the others, in a broader process of evolution. With Karl Marx, we know that humans as individuals don't make history, so uh, are not the center of history anymore, but do make history through social classes clashes. And finally, with Sigmund Freud, is even worse because we are even divided into, into ourselves, uh, having the unconscious part more dominant and the rationality just the tip of the iceberg. So my question is, will technology be the last and definitive stage of this process? Will we be dominated by algorithms and become victim of a technological fate? Uh, Pope Francis' response to that is very deep. He speaks of uh, in a technology, technocratic paradigm, and he said that technology is not neutral since it affects any dimension of power, justice, responsibility, and peace. For that, we need ethics, for that, we need religious. In the time allowed, I will be very honored to explain what we do at the Vatican in that regard. Thank you. Many thanks for this uh, intervention. So let's conclude the first round of intervention with uh, Susanna Trotta. Susanna, you have the floor. Thank you, um, and I'm glad to join this conversation today. Um, thanks for having me. And I'd like to contribute a few thoughts about how um, what we know about partnerships with religious actors in wider development work might be interesting with respect to our conversation on AI, on new technologies, on, on, and on faith and interfaith dialogue and action. So partnerships, as we know, are important for the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, SDG 17 specifically focuses on them. And uh, in the last decade or so, uh, religious actors have increasingly been acknowledged by the UN and other stakeholders as key partners. From the 2009 uh, United Nations Population Funds uh, guidelines for engaging faith-based organizations, um, to the Interagency Task Force on Religion and Sustainability Development. And um, there's now a plethora of uh, organizations which specifically focus on partnerships with religious actors for sustainable development um, part, the JLI, etc. And there's a growing body of uh, academic literature on religion and development. Um, maybe Catherine Marshall is the most well-known name, um, Barbara Bonpani, etc. Um, but why is this relevant to AI? 
Um, well, as we know, uh, AI already has or has the potential to have an impact on all SDGs, as well as, uh, as on shaping the post-2030 agenda. Uh, and Vinues et al, they have explored ways to assess this positive and negative impact. And they suggested that there's a need to better understand the challenges, risks and opportunity posed by AI and to then to regulate the use of these technologies to achieve what they call sustainable AI. And, and they, they also state that this must be a participatory um, process. Um, and so in terms of religious actors, what does this process, uh, what should this process look like? Um, what do these partnerships um, look like? Um, and maybe I'll have time to say a few more words on this uh, later, um, but my key points are the following. So there's a lot to learn from the literature and experiences on a religious engagement in development work. And I think this experience can help um, build strong partnerships among faith actors and between them and other stakeholders in the field of AI. There are already examples of these types of partnerships and collaborations, but they are really under-researched and sometimes remain under the radar. And then lastly, in thinking of partnerships among and with religious actors in AI, I think it's key to consider their diversity and the very different ways in which they, I mean religious actors, as well as other stakeholders, might understand AI and the challenges and opportunities it presents and why they might be interested or reluctant to engage with it based on what their priorities are. Um, I mean, understanding and acknowledging their agency. So, and I think it has to do with what uh, Professor Geraci was saying, this um, uh, having a dialogue uh, between different narratives, uh, fears, expectations. Thank you. So, um, this was an introduction, as you may have noticed, into the personalities of the panelists, the concerns, the, the angle, what they prepared for our session tonight. Huh? An introduction, of course, to the topic. And uh, I uh, let me welcome, in particular, this last reference uh, by Susanna to the connection between this particular topic, artificial intelligence, the broader, the broader uh, conversation on technology revolution, and our overall effort on sustainable development and uh, the, the, the G20, the engagement with, with the G20 um, um, in, in general. And this is uh, um, something which is very dear to, to, to us. This was very strong in the preparation of this thematic session, which was meant to speak to both the, the past, the present, and the future to the G20 interfaith process. We are rooted, and that's why we started with a, a witness and a protagonist of the history of the G20 interfaith. It's, it's well rooted in the past of the G20 interfaith, and James is a living testimony to this. Um, we, uh, we are in the present of, of this very, very conference, and we, we heard in multiple discussions already and very powerfully this morning, for those who were there, from the, uh, the Green Patriarch, uh, about this uh, importance and challenge of technology, and of course the future. So this is uh, this is how we conceived this this panel, and this is where now we we uh, uh, will go uh, more in detail with the second round from our uh, four speakers, which will enable each of them to go more in detail and to uh, take a different pace, a more relaxed pace in uh, um, the uh, uh, account for uh, individual uh, trajectories of research and engagement in, in the topic. So um, to introduce uh, the, the, the next uh, round, um, Sus uh, Susanna Trotta will uh, talk about lessons for our theme from religion and development. This was already announced. Um, then Robert Geraci will come uh, a f a second and he will speak about decision making and public policy at the intersection of religion and AI. Uh, third, Branca. Branca will speak uh, of weaponization of artificial intelligence. And last but not the least, Alessio will talk about the interfaith technology and the need for a new humanism. This will be, again, as I mentioned, a slightly more relaxed. 
uh, time for each of them, seven to eight minutes, still short, as you may notice, for the sake of keeping a certain rhythm. Uh, we are at the end of the day. We, we had a very, very intense day already, so this is meant to, to help our attention. But, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's also meant to, to trigger some, some reaction from the audience, um, and we will leave enough time for that. So, um, Susanna, back to you. Um, lessons from religion and development for our theme, Interfaith Dialogue on Artificial Intelligence and the Technology Revolution. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, so I'll provide a bit more detailed insights into um, how uh, the experience of partnerships in uh, between sorry, um, in development work with faith actors can, can help us better understand and shape collaborations uh, in AI. And I'll start from Catherine Marshall's uh, recent piece, um, which I've, uh, sh I've mentioned her before, but in it she, she lists the advantages of partnering with religious actors. And she says they, they enjoy uh, trust in their communities, they deliver services, um, health services, education, they provide social safety nets, uh, they communicate, uh, most importantly for us, um, through traditional but also through social media, they wield financial and political power, they can mobilize different types of resources. But in the same piece, she also says, it is useful, and I quote, um, to bear in mind that religion can be also part of the problem as well as part of the solution, end of quote. So it is true that partnerships with and among religious actors can indeed uh, present significant challenges. Um, Aza Karam also spoke about that, uh, and she said in 2016, she wrote um, that it would be useful to avoid uh, overemphasizing religious leaders and religious leadership in partnering with religious actors. I add, and I'm not quoting Aza Karam here, <laughs> that uh, it, um, it would be also um, helpful to avoid only focusing on, on, on elder and on male leaders, um, but uh, rather engage uh, female leaders um, and younger leaders, lay leaders. Uh, she also, Aza Karam says, um, we shouldn't over-moralize um, foreign policy development and uh, partnership agendas. And, and, and we should also avoid assuming that working with religious organizations will lead to them changing to be more like us. And the last one is a quote. And, and also several scholars um, have pointed out that there is a need to avoid instrumental engagements. Um, uh, and, and they mean partnerships um, that are aimed at using religious actors' resources to pursue the SDGs without fully acknowledging their agency, their diversity, their context, and their complexities. Um, and now uh, I will try to, to provide some examples of current uh, existing um, religious actors' collaborative engagements in the field of AI and technological innovation. And I'll try to link them with these reflections on religion's engagement in the wider sustainable development framework by asking some questions, because this is a very um, um, open field, I think. We're the, at the beginning of uh, understanding these, these issues. Um, now, there's evidence that religious actors are forming interfaith partnerships and collaborations with other stakeholders to raise awareness and, and to influence policymakers on some key ethical issues around AI. For instance, the use of autonomous weapons, um, and Branca Marian, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk more about that, um, around the right to privacy, etc. And the Rome Call for Ethics, I think, is <laughs> perhaps the most well-known example. Um, some religious actors also t took part in consultations with the EU on, uh, on AI regulation on, on the white paper. Um, religious actors are also partnering with businesses, not only to develop AI-based products and systems that are used in religious practice to find better ways to preserve their cultural and scriptural heritage, but also to provide solutions to local and global challenges. Um, and today, uh, I think at the same time as this event, um, a symposium on how to use digital communication for social justice is taking place organized by the World Council of Churches, the World Association for Christian Communication and Bread for the World, other partners. And one of these sessions is called How to Improve that Dialogue Between Faith Communities, Civil Society Networks and Big Tech Companies. 
So there, there, there's uh, something is going on here, no? In a similar vein, some religious actors are experimenting with innovative tools in humanitarian work. FinChurch Aid is exploring the possibility of using blockchain technology for cash distribution in the Kakuma camp in Kenya, the refugee camp, and has co-organized coding classes for refugees in Greece, uh, in collaboration with other NGOs. So, I think also most importantly, um, various voices have been raised by religious actors of different traditions around their own understanding of AI technologies and their ethics. The Church of Scotland, for instance, has issued a document on AI-related opportunities and challenges for the Church. Um, but from non-Christian traditions, examples are the indigenous protocol on AI, um, Chaudhry's reflections on Islamic digital ethics, and Hong Ladrom, Buddhist perspective on AI and ethics. So here are my questions, and then I'm, I'm done. Um, first one is, uh, how effective are these existing partnerships with and among religious actors on AI? Um, how could these efforts be enhanced? Um, second one is, what would meaningful non-instrumental partnerships with and among religious actors in the field of AI look like? What is hindering them, if anything? And the third one is, what is there to avoid in analyzing, considering, or fostering partnerships with religious actors in the AI sector? What shouldn't we be doing? Um, many thanks for listening and I look forward to the rest of our conversation. Uh, many thanks, Susanna. Uh, I think that I have one minute for one remark. Yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, Yes, yeah, okay, it's okay. Uh, I think that you made a wonderful intervention. Uh, and uh, if we have the possibility, I would like to go deeper on the meaning that you attribute to partnership. I mean, what does partnership mean? Uh, because partnership, you can have a partnership when you have two people at the, the two parts of the table which have the same weight and they agree to do work together. Uh, in the context of AI, is this the scenario we have? I'm asking, is this the scenario we have? Uh, because, I mean, some scholars argue that uh, religious groups are more reactive than proactive because they feel threatened. Uh, they see uh, a new emerging, uh, we can call humanism, uh, with uh, may then maybe we don't like that humanism, or maybe that religious group don't, don't like the new emerging humanism and they want to try to intervene on that. But is that a partnership or is something else? Uh, and then at the same time, religious groups also can claim that they are threatened in, the in their values by the race of the AI. Think about, uh, for instance, how uh, the development of the EU, EU border control is evolving with the huge use of AI to block and track migrants. Uh, I would suspect that many religious groups are not happy about that. So is that a partnership or is something else? Uh, or, of course, uh, uh, you mentioned the consultation on the AI regulation and so on. These all, uh, I always say, also in a regulatory, regulatory context, that you have to be st distinguish between normative and regulatory context, and there are two different things, because I include the, in the normative the ethical part that we have seen, and we have also to look at the two together on how they evolve. Uh, the current European, but I would say global, uh, normative and regulatory ecosystem is very frizzy, I would say, with uh, a lot of uh, regulation and normative options coming from all over. Uh, and I wonder where, do, where does the partnership fit and where we see something else. And this is, I think, a, a good connection with what we will hear now on public policy at the intersection of religion and AI. Uh, and uh, Robert, uh, Professor Robert Geraci, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pasquale, and thank you to everyone in the room. I, I trust there are people in the room. <laughs> we, we can't actually see from here, so so hopefully you're there and, and so far pleased to be where you are. Because I am first, I, uh, my standpoint is a scholar of religion, I want to start with a little bit of theory from the study of religion. And, and this isn't hard theory, this is basic theory that in the study of religion, we discriminate between insider perspectives and outsider perspectives. That is, you're either part of a tradition that you are investigating, or you're outside that tradition, and there are always pros and cons to both. Neither one is better than the other necessarily. An insider asks different questions about a tradition than an outsider, but also sees different things. Um, but but the, the, 
the positioning of inside and outside of drawing boundaries and borders is one that as scholars, we might apply to a kind of methodological standpoint, but which as human beings, as members of culture, we see all around us all the time. And in particular, while scholars might attempt to balance their inside outside perspectives as best they can, uh, we see in a political sense that human beings have a fairly terrible history of behavior toward our fellow human beings, um, disparaging even their essential humanness. This is, this is longstanding history that we might look as insiders to one community and say those outsiders aren't even human, right? And this produces a, a, a compulsion toward control and cruelty. And that these two attitudes, which are among the, the problematic aspects of our own humanity, are things that play in to the way in which we're going to think about AI, the way in which we're going to employ AI, right? That if, if religion and culture both have a kind of colonial history that says this is a mechanism for controlling other human beings, um, they don't always have to be that. And I wish to be hopeful. I want to remind everyone of our almost universally shared ethical injunction to welcome outsiders, to transform strangers into guests. That transformation is in us. And I think the G20 Interfaith aspires to fix some of the tragedies of the past in the sense of understanding that others can be our guests and our friends and are our, our, our part of our human family. So as it engages artificial intelligence, the Interfaith Forum has press members of the G20, especially the most powerful among us, to protect the most vulnerable. And one way is in thinking about algorithmic decision-making. Many of you may not be familiar with algorithmic decision-making, and that's exactly the point I want to, to make. I'm referring to machine learning technologies that fuel decision-making in industry in, in industry, in banking, in judicial systems, in medical systems. Uh, to a considerable extent, we are absolving ourselves of decision-making power without having first fixed our own moral failures. And, and that's really deeply relevant because AI decision-making could be incredibly beneficial. At present, it is not. It is not because the data that are used for machine learning are already, already prejudiced. They're our data, they're our behaviors. And what we need to do is look for what we ought to be. And that's what we ought to be engaging with as we think about technologies like machine learning. And I wanna give you three quick examples in case you're not quite familiar with these technologies. But for example, um, hiring. If we have a technology that screens applicants, that's looking for applicants that are likely to succeed at this job. Well, the way we would get those data is we would go get people who seem to be successful at this job and then we would feed all their data into the system and it would learn that this was like a category of data that indicates likely success. Well, the problem is if you've drawn all that data, all those data from a past in which, for example, white men were singularly considered capable and responsible and hireable. If all of your examples at the CEO level, you know, if 90% if of them are men, then what you end up with is an algorithm that looks for men or looks for people who graduated from certain universities or looks for people from certain, it could look for people from certain kinds of neighborhoods, right? And, and what that does is it takes the prejudice that we already have and it builds it into the system. And the moment we've forgotten about our own responsibility in the decision-making, we've just allowed that system to reify our prejudices and make them all the more powerful. You can see the same thing happening in housing loan um, machine learning algorithms as to who gets a loan, who's considered trustworthy of a loan. Uh, and we see the same thing in judicial sentencing. Should someone be sentenced to probation or three years in jail? Uh, the judicial sentencing algorithms have so far been incredibly racist. 
right? So we need to, to, to work on that. So how do we do that, right? Well, we have to become educated. We have to start with the racist biases in our own country, the gender, the sexuality-based biases. And these are gonna differ from place to place. In any given place, we have to think about where are our biases, where are the ways in which we are, we are making life for the vulnerable even worse? Then how do we, then, because only then can we think about what we're going to fix. But we have to think about how algorithms can be used in decision-making. What are the dom domains where they're appropriate? And how do we build them in, in a way that makes both the algorithm accountable and the human beings accountable? And we have to educate ourselves about bias in the algorithms, that we will not make wise decisions if the machine learning is already biased. If the data that comes to us are wrong, then we won't, we won't do anything productive. So on the religious side, we have real motivation, right? We have to take that goal of how we welcome strangers, how we turn strangers into guests, how we turn others into something like insiders, right? We have to, we have to work toward that. One aspect of that is we're going to have to accept a kind of public reasoning. My argument for something has to be reasonable to you, regardless of what your position is. If it's just reasonable to me, then we fight over it. Right? It has to be reasonable to you. We don't always get everything we want, especially if it's uniquely relevant. And on the policy side, we have to institute anti-bias auditing. This needs to be mandated for every government activity in which machine learning is relevant. And also in industries where government regulation, uh, you know, here in America, people say bad things about government regulation, but it's part of the process. Government regulation has to be involved we, as Branca said earlier, the governments have to get involved in these conversations and have to say that certain things are gonna be allowable kinds of algorithm decision-making and other kinds are not going to be allowable. Um, and I think religious communities can help generate these kinds of policy decisions, these kinds of policy positions. We've seen religious communities all across the world help um, direct governments toward particular kinds of outcomes. And in this day and age, well, one thing we need are for religious communities to say, okay, we're going to take some of our shared values that make sense to all of us. And we're gonna make sure those are the values that we're going to press for our governments to get involved. Uh, we're going to mobilize around our shared pursuit of justice, our shared desire to protect those on the margins because I'm not aware of any religious community that, that has a, a broad moral injunction that says people on the margins deserve to be there. That's not a thing, right? The, the better side of our humanity is there in our, in our religious organizations also. And so what we really need to see, and you know, the G20 interfaith can be involved both in terms of its religious communities internally and in religious communities as they engage with their with their government policy makers is to think about how do we make these shared goals ones that are policy mandated goals right that are regulated goals thank you very much thank you robert thank you uh let me take uh the opportunity uh to to to, to add to what you said uh under this uh, policy perspective that, uh, as I mentioned, that uh, um, this uh, thematic session stems from the work of the working group of the G G20 Interfaith on Science and Technology. A part of our work um, it, uh, uh, will be available during the G20 Interfaith. I'm not sure about under which form, but we will become available soon as a set of policy recommendations, in fact, a true policy, policy brief, where um, some of the claims by, by Robert and the calls, <laughs> the true call by, by Robert can be uh, identified with some uh, um, and, um, more um, precisions and uh, some textual uh, development. So, well, you, you, you're very free 
to already be in touch with me uh, if you're interested in the text, but the, the text of the policy brief would be then uh, uh, made available on the G20 Interfaith uh, uh, website. And thank you very much, uh, Robert, again, for um, contributing this, this crucial angle, I mean, taking the responsibility to go there the, this morning, as Akaram mentioned, mm -hmm. accountability and, and, and holding everybody accountable. And, and we want this thematic session to actually be fully on that line. And I'm sure that Branca now is going to follow precisely on these steps. Uh, Branca, you have the floor to, um, to, 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 to develop further your initial uh, points about weaponization of artificial intelligence. Thank you, Marco. And I just, yeah, I'm going to build up on um, Robert's points as well about, uh, you know, the fact that there is a sense of in, even inevitability about some of these technologies, right? You look, if you look at the news, if you look at um, recent statistics and the use of some of these um, AI systems, you might be left with a sense that there really isn't much that can be done or the sense that the regulation is lagging behind the technological development so much that it, you know, that sense of will it constantly play catch up, will it catch up, um, are certain, certain concerns that I think are fair, but I think we need to be in a sense understanding the role the governments have to play. And this is why in that policy brief that you will hopefully see soon, we really stress the fact um, because that's what experts told us, that it is ultimately governments who have that capability. And But as you know, Robert was explaining, the way in which that governance and policy process happens does include a wider array of actors who do have a stake very much in this conversation. Um, when you think about weaponization of artificial intelligence, um, you know, here you, you could think of a number of things. So I'm going to kind of narrow it down a bit and focus on three, maybe more specific things. One is the use of artificial intelligence in weapon systems directly in platforms that is the incor incorporation of these um, algorithmic, essentially decision-making models or other sorting models or analysis models. And the second is the, the potential for some of this AI to be used maliciously against, um, against particular individuals or communities, including ethnic and religious communities, um, and that could really have an impact on international stability. And the third is what came across in our engagement, which is this very real concern about how AI is already being used in the security sector in sort of very real interactions that individuals are having. Um, and Robert already mentioned the judicial sector and you know algor algorithms making the decision of whether someone should be granted parole or not and how biased those decisions have been. And, Precisely because of what Robert outlined, they're using data that is biased data, that is maybe historical data, that is, you know, data that has data has a lot of problems. And so what came across um, in our discussions really was this great concern about autonomous weapon systems, which I promise I didn't push, even though it was one of my greatest concerns, but it really came across in the in these conversations. And when you think about autonomous weapon systems, you might be thinking about very sophisticated types of systems, but what we're talking about here are existing platforms that can use machine learning um, to maybe select and engage targets. And here, that's when we talk about fully autonomous weapon systems. We're talking about systems where that those what we call critical functions of uh, weapons, that is sele selection and engagement of targets, are performed by the system itself. Um, and here, there's been a lot of discussion and debate at the United Nations since 2014. The UN uh, Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons has been meeting and discussing this idea of the need for some human oversight or human control. But there isn't a lot of agreement on what that control looks like and what that human oversight actually looks like. Um, I think there's a general understanding that a human operator simply accepting, uh, you know, like you accept, I don't know, the privacy, the GDPR, uh, you know, cookies on your, uh, when you visit websites, that kind of acceptance would not be sufficient. 
And the reasons for why we need strong sort of human control are numerous. They're ethical, legal, technical. From an ethical perspective, what really came across in, in this conversation, and it's really been at the core of um, the United Nations discussions, is the, this concept of human dignity, right? That uh, machines should not be um, making decisions over human lives, that they should not be delegated uh, that, um, that particular task. Ethicists such as Wendell Wallach have, you know, called autonomous weapon systems, um, you know, they have said that these are systems should be seen as malign, say, or evil in themselves. And uh, Wallach argues that particularly uh, this is the case because they lack discrimination, they lack empathy, and the capacity to make proportional judgments which are necessary for weighing civilian casualties against achieving military objectives. And then Wallach also notes that delegating life and death decisions to machines is immoral because machines cannot be held responsible for their actions. And that, uh, that notion of responsibility, and Marco mentioned accountability, is also central because our existing laws and our existing international humanitarian law in particular um, place, you know, it's, it's ultimately the humans who are held responsible. It is the human operator. Uh, it is a commander who's held responsible for whatever action is taken. But if a decision about human life is being made by an algorithms, an algorithm, sorry, who would be held responsible? And at the moment, under existing law, existing international law, it is not clear that anyone could be actually held responsible. Indeed, it is not very likely. So we're in a situation where there's a clear accountability gap for the use of these systems. In, in contexts which I always say are very acute. So all of the concerns that we have about bias in you know, government decision-making government decision making across various fields, those are that much more amplified in contexts which are dynamic, contexts you know, which are ever changing, contexts where human lives are really being impacted. That is in, uh, in war zones. So as Susanna noted, religious communities have been a part of these discussions at the United Nations and have put out um, you know, their own policy perspectives and positions and have been calling for a greater attention to that need to respect human lives and to respect that decision over human lives and to ensure that there is accountability. So we already have a sense, I think, at the international level that, um, you know, though I've presented you, and I always do these dystopian scenarios, right, of uh, killer robots run amok, um, what actually countries are starting to realize is the need to place some red lines and is the need to ensure that these kinds of systems are not um, are, are not just developed without any kinds of regulations. Um, and there's very good reasons for that. We're, you know, with these systems, we're worried about hacking, we're worried about errors, we're worried about mistakes, misperceptions. There's so many international security aspects to that discussion that deserve, um, I think, serious consideration. In terms of how AI could be used maliciously, you can think of a number of a uh, number of different examples. I don't know if you've seen deep fakes or deep fake videos or images that will show, you know, Barack Obama in one instance, for example, making a statement that he would never make. And indeed, in the video, he says that that it would be very out of character for him to say it. And then, you know, you see that it's actually a U.S. director who has used AI to kind of uh, make statements. That you know, use of AI is concerning because it could potentially uh, result in greater destabilization because you can imagine contexts, like Robert said, contexts are so important. You can imagine contexts where you know, a religious leader or a politician um, making disparaging statements about other communities um, you know, could result in uh, real actual violence and harm. So there's a, you know, there's a way that these technologies could be misused uh, that would have specific implications on our overall security. And I'm going to, I know I don't want to take up too much of the time, but I just want to stress the, 
the concern that came across uh, in our, all of our discussions about surveillance and surveillance technologies. Um, and in our policy brief, we note, for example, that in 2019, at least 75 countries were using AI technologies for surveillance purposes. And indeed, with the global pandemic, that those numbers have risen. And you know, these surveillance tools can both be helpful, but can also cause um, great harm and are of great concern to individuals that we and experts that we consulted. And the use of AI in surveillance technologies in particular has brought forward the need to consider specific responses to uh, technologies such as facial recognition technologies, which are being considered in the European Union, in the United States and other places. And these regulatory responses, um, you know, really have to focus on the fact that these technologies tend to impact um, already disadvantaged communities and, uh, you know, result in sort of greater inequalities. So I don't want to leave you with the sort of <laughs> all concern and no possible action. So uh, some of what we've uh, recognized and realized and heard um, from experts as well is, the, is this need for these multi-level governance frameworks, as I said. So at the international level, what's very, very clear about defense and security uses is that we need specific red lines and specific prohibitions so that we don't, do not end up in scenarios where systems that are not uh, ready for deployment systems that you know can cause great harm are used. Uh, we need national policies, and we heard from Robert, and we need human rights protections to ensure that individuals are protected. We also need codes of conduct. Um, we need you know the technical experts in the technical community to be very thoughtful about the technologies that they're developing, because these are uh, multi-use technologies that could um, you know, be, be really maliciously used and we need some more thought given to that. And then finally, um, the role of faith and religious-based communities, the, the role of civil society organizations and the wider community is, is so central because a lot of these concerns ended up on the agenda of the United Nations precisely because of that push from these from these communities and individual experts who raise that concern. So the fact that we even started talking about autonomous weapons at the international level really was because of this push that came from, from civil society advocacy. So I would urge you to think about the kind of responses um, that are needed in a much more holistic and multi-layered way, because I this kind of technology requires um, requires that kind of response. So I will end it there. And I know I have so much more to say about this, but hopefully there will be some questions as well. Thank you. Many thanks, Branka. And actually, I would have a lot to say also uh, to comment on all the points that you have raised. I just want to say one thing uh, as a lawyer. Uh, Roman law has taught us and has taught Western civilization that we would divide the law between public and private law, okay? And uh, our systems of international law over the years have operated in that fashion. I mean, it was quite clear what was uh, state apparatus, what were private companies and so on. Uh, probably it's not the case anymore. Uh, in the context of uh, AI, and running algorithm and big tech companies. Are Facebook and Google uh, private or public? If you consider the access that, you know, certain state authorities have to it. And uh, is, this is not only concerned the United States, but can concern also China. Are certain big tech Chinese companies public or private? Do they operate for private business or do they operate for the Chinese state? Just to be on the balance and put on the balance to completely different states, which often disagree. This makes much more complex the way we approach it, because if we use the epistemic notions that we think that the public has to regulate the private, my impression is that we will not end up uh, in uh, you know, having a very good solution if we resonate with our old schemes. So uh, before we decide what we have to do, we probably have to, have to decide who has to do it, uh, which makes things much more complex, if you want, because then uh, uh, Technology and evolution continue to develop because, as uh, was also stressed, uh, was also underlined by Roberts, we don't only have AI. We have uh, machine learning technologies. Think about uh, a field like digital health, for instance. I mean, you don't understand digital health if you don't uh, conceive the role that machine learning uh, 
as in that context, that's for good. This is a technology for good. It's not, that's not a technology for weaponization. But we don't understand what will what will happen if we, for instance, don't refer to quantum computing and the role that this will have maybe in weaponization of AI and so on. So we are going forward to look for a very complex conversation over the next few years. And I think that we can conclude with a, a sui, sui generis public uh, uh, actor, in a way, uh, with, uh, with Alessio Pecorario, that uh, maybe will give us uh, some food for thoughts. You have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Anichino. I, I, I'm very intrigued about your last questions, but if you allow me, I would like to, to start with your previous observation about being more proactive and less, uh, and not, not only reactive, let's say. Uh, and uh, uh, as Professor Geraci was saying, also trying to show how we are contributing to this increasing requirement for participating to the political demandings. And uh, we start, of course, from the assumption that uh, is made by Pope Francis regarding the fact that technology is, is not neutral and that uh, there is no technofix solution to social and environmental problems especially. Technology cannot be evaluated merely through its te technical abilities or merely through its potential to increase human productiv productivity, but more importantly, it should be evaluated through we, the way it influences human freedom and agency. And the Catholic Church, from our part, uh, has a grand tradition of dialogue in faith and reason with many prominent scientists uh, in history who were strong adherents to Catholic faith. But most importantly, I would say that we are trying to be more um, proactive uh, because in this, as well, the Church is committed to the ethical and moral discourse surrounding new technologies in collaboration with other faith traditions and moral codes, uh, which serve to enrich and complete to our pursuit for truth and understanding. Um, this is crucial since um, it can be said that at least conceptually religions have a, a double av advantage over, over the modern nation. First of all, uh, they, have, they exist way before modern nations were created and religions will probably continue to, ex to exist regardless uh, of any political setting. And this can, can help to address prevailing short-term approach in economics and politics. And secondly, regarding space, of course uh, they are spread through many nations. And this again, very helpful if we only think that uh, contemporary problems like climate change and uh, nuclear disarmament or migration transcend national borders as well. So what do we do more in concrete at the, at the, the, the OLC level? And lastly, with the creation of this Vatican COVID-19 commission to which I, I belong, um, let, we can say that uh, the Commission is an intergovernmental uh, institution that aims at analyzing the interconnected and unprecedented crisis exacerbated by the pandemic to propose and make actions to regenerate our troubled world in a proper synodal way, meaning by working together not only with the many Vatican departments, but also with the most prominent representatives from international organizations, civil society and private sector. Most of all, the Commission has prioritized, as I was saying, ecumenical and interreligious dialogue in its pursuit of promoting the common good in the digital age. We are there to listen and connect the best science and the best the, 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 the theology, possibly, and to inspire political leaders uh, in order to restore primarily a proper multilateral system by being creative, concrete, and professional and in that way contribute, for example, to the UN system as uh, um, my, the previous interlocutor, so, um, Branka Marian was saying uh, regarding the UN. We are focusing a lot, for example, on the UN working groups uh, uh, regarding cybersecurity. Um, within the broader from, framework of the Vatican COVID-19 Commission, the Security Task Force, which I coordinate, has a dedicated working group on new technologies for peace and integral human development. This group holds that the pandemic crisis has many facets, but central to it are structural in, in, in inequities, and they need to reimagine and create a new understanding of security that prioritizes the person over the state. Uh, on that, we offer the concept of integral security, which means uh, that security is not made of new weapons, of modernization of nuclear arsenals, or in uh, aggressive military rhetoric is made mainly of uh, what we call our priorities, food for all, jobs for all, 
access to public health for all, all the ingredients of the human dignity. And, uh, and uh, um, regarding the, the grand picture that is at stake when it comes to, 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 to technology, I was mentioning the issue of the technological revolution. The security task force in that sense fostered especially Pope Francis' vision um, on the dialogue between faith and reason. And in truth, it is not just a technological revolution. It goes much deeper. This is a new world view across frontiers, societies, generations, and faiths. What is at stake is more uh, than the use of artificial intelligence. Our call is uh, for a new humanism, uh, which is a controversial term, uh, but one which will enable human person to find themselves, and uh, one that cultivates an ethical and not cosmetic dimension of life, both personal and professional. We are seeking a future where analysis and decisions, as well as scientific and technological achievements, go hand in hand with philosophical and ethical values. This future rejects technocracy and invites partnership and collaboration, particularly among religions who can guide humanity to a greater pursuit of wisdom and the common good. In this sense, the Church is ready to meet new technological challenges with the foundation of its deep tradition in scientific thought and armed with love for the poor and respect for the entire person. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. So we ending uh, this round with um, um, some very substantial remarks, but at the same time, forgive me for that as because of my legal background, with some institutional framework as well. Eh? Uh, and the, you know, this uh, um, plasticity of, uh, of, of religious organizations and institutions, which is a, a very important ingredient in our, in our conversation as a response, precisely, to this very flexible new world. If there's, if, if there's someone, uh, a, 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 some organization which has a, a, a fundamental resources to, ad to address this reshuffling and, uh, you know, going the establish borders, public and private, profit, non-profit, well, that's, that's precisely religious organization. So this is going to be a, a very crucial test for them uh, also in this respect, as, as uh, uh, this aspect of uh, institutional organizational mobilization is crucial for the G20 uh, interfaith and the engagement uh, of, of religious actors with uh, the new multilateral. A conversation on the destiny of mankind. Thank you very much, all of you, for you know being uh, uh, within the time, staying within the time limits, despite your passion and you know knowledge. Um, this enables, well, first of all, all, all of you uh, to, to have a very final uh, round. But first of all, uh, let me ask if someone in the audience would like to ask questions or uh, utter remarks or. We have a microphone in, in, in the room, please. You, you just introduce yourself sure. so that we can have your, your name for, for the record. Thanks very much. My name is Patrick Reynold. I'm the Belgian ambassador to the OEC. And up till one year ago, I was ambassador in charge of IT and, and cyber in my country. Um, I, I would like to come back to, to what you very eloquently and very rightly said about uh, military aspect of that. You're perfectly right in saying that uh, within the, Uni in the United Nations there is a debate over there. Also within the, U the NATO, we have a debate about that, about the who is going to take the final decision to yes or no, are we going to kill this person, to be very clear. And we cannot have an agreement, nor within the, in the United Nations, and of course we all have an idea of where the most uh, stringent opposition to that comes from, but in, indeed within the NATO it's not. We, we don't have an, an, a, a general agreement on that one. Many reasons on that one, but I mean the vast, vast majority of the European countries are indeed for a human final decision. Some say that in a, in a case of a real war that one should have to take something like 12 or 15 decisions per second. So I mean it's not humanly feasible. Because we're talking about what we call, I mean, the new, the new idea is not to go to very elaborate weapons, but having some kind of literally hundreds of thousands of drones with IT, learning from each other every, everything they, they will do, 
And that would be indestructible because it's impossible to stop 50,000 drones that, that just descend upon you. So, I mean, technically speaking, but most importantly, and that, that's my question, um, what, I mean, the general idea in the, between brackets, Western world is, is debatable. I mean, and majority is saying we have to have a human decision. It's not the case to everyone. Uh, and I would like to know if you have any idea about other religions on this point, in particular, the Orthodox religion. Uh, you see what I'm, uh, uh, which country I'm, I'm talking about, and other religions as well. So, I mean, within the religions and the, the, the major religions in the world, is there some kind of general approach that would be similar and that could be defended together? Because otherwise, it's going to be more than difficult. Thank you, and sorry for being yeah, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Well, Branka, you the probably the ideal person to respond. But every everybody is invited to step in if uh, you feel like you want to uh, continue the conversation. Yeah, Branka, maybe. Sure, sure. Well, thank you so much for that question. I I think what's really interesting here um, is that we've seen a, a number of countries that have actually agreed upon this idea of some human oversight, involvement, engagement. And I think what Robert was saying that what we found in our sort of discussions and expert agreements is that indeed a lot of these religions do share this, no, this notion of human dignity or you know some sort of sanctity or you know, or the sort of protection of the human soul and this idea of how um, decisions over human lives are to be taken very seriously and, you know, should not be taken by machines. I think that is cross-cutting across the different religions. So I don't think that there would be a position from the religious sides of these discussions. I think what you are going to find is that it is more techno optimism or perceptions about, you know, responding to security issues, um, you know, asymmetries in warfare that's pushing more that use of, uh, of these kinds of systems. And you talk about, you know, drone swarms and responding to drone swarms. I think that kind of swarming technology is very real and that, that these kinds of developments are going to prompt um, a much needed conversation. One thing that gets overlooked, I think, at the United Nations is that you will um, have countries like China agree to certain prohibitions on certain uses, which I think is perhaps surprising and we're not sometimes sure um, how genuine that kind of commitment is. But if, um, if you look at that, I think it, it provides some opening or some room to sort of start building these dialogues. And I fully recognize how challenging some of this will be, um, even amongst, like you mentioned, NATO, uh, you know, partners and allies. Um, but I think that we're heading in the direction with the speed of warfare, that that kind of, um, that kind of decision will have to, um, I think, come sooner or later on where different countries stand. So I think there's a lot of opportunity, I think, from the civil society and religious uh, communities. We're certainly seeing a lot of push for that, that sort of level of human control, certainly when humans are being targeted. I think that's where um, I, I think we're going to see a lot of agreement um, when it's humans being targeted. And then I think it'll be a separate conversation about um, different objects. Hope that answers the question. That it's a bit weird being in the room yeah. and not in the room. Yeah, Robert, go ahead. Yeah, yes, yes, Robert. Okay, thank you. Um, two things. One, I think there's a, a one thing that we will have to accept is that in order, for example, to pass nuclear, the nuclear uh, non-proliferation treaty, that meant nations that had more power had to find ways to share in order to encourage other people not to develop nuclear weapons. And in the world of AI and robotics, that might be part of the conversation and might need to be part of the conversation. But more to the point, I think what the, you know, the speaker's question goes directly to this issue of um, efficiency 
that if you can create, whether it's drones or other automated weapon systems that can target and kill more efficiently, that that's, that that's a win, right? Like that's what you're pursuing is this more efficient military enterprise. And I do think one of the roles, and, and that has nothing to do with what religion anyone is in, in any country, anywhere in America or in the world, I'm sorry. Like anywhere in the world, people are thinking about how do we create efficiency with our technologies? Right. And I think one of the things that religious groups ought to be pushing back on is that as a central uh, goal, the whole idea that we should be maximally um, efficient in, in everything uh, is actually usually just leads to deferred cost to somewhere else. Right. Look at how 20th century, late 20th century industrial capitalism deferred all the costs of its environmental catastrophe to the 21st century and called that efficient economic practice, right? And, and A, it's not actually efficient, nor would it be efficient to have massive military asymmetries that lead to some nations being able to kill everyone at the drop of a hat. That's not actually efficient. It's only efficient from a very blinded perspective. And what, what religious groups could contribute to that conversation is by saying, hold on, let's look at what our value system is. And let's, tr let's say we want technological development, but we sure as hell don't want a blinded short-term efficiency to be the guiding principle of humanity. Like that's a terrible principle. We're proving over the last 150 years what a terrible principle it is. So how about we all get on board from our respective positions? I think we probably can in fact agree that that short-term blinder we're all looking for efficiency has not worked and that we can find a better way forward and we can do it collaboratively. Let me add uh, that how much we need to learn through the um, debate on technology about the changing concept of security and security and religion. We, we, we heard before this uh, integrated security concept. We might be familiar with the comprehensive security, the concept in the uh, OSC context, but even from uh, the, 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 the technological perspective and uh, the, 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 there's really a, a, a shift in, 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 in the concept and, and the conversation is, is broadening up. If you, if you um, uh, want to check in, in the website of the G20 Interfaith, you will find one of our preparatory webinars, uh, which was held one week ago, and we invited a family of uh, projects funded by the EU under a uh, security uh, and, and technology funding scheme for European consortia, and all of them uh, working at present on uh, uh, advanced new generation technology for worship places, places of worship. And it's, it's one of the most amazing things is how all of these consortia, all of these groups are spending EU money in the first place uh, to work out new concepts and new partnerships. Uh, uh, in, in, including very often the um, security forces themselves. One, one, one of, the, of the partners is, is a project which uh, involves um, security agencies from Bavaria, um, Flanders, and, uh, the, and Sweden. Uh, most, and, and the interesting thing is while the focus is on worship places, in some of these consortia, people from religious studies or religious organizations themselves, uh, well, they, they, they don't even represent the majority of experts who, who, who work in. This is probably good. <laughs> this is not necessarily bad. I mean, this is good insofar as the partnership is, is well built. And, 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 and this is a part of, again, the conversation very often on security in particular, that the whole methodology uh, is, is, is rapidly changing. Someone else in the audience would like to ask questions or making some points or you seem to, 
Hello? Yeah, maybe your name, please. Oh, I'm sorry. This is yeah. David Poli of the IAC Council. And um, I'm uh, asking the question about what data is there about what different religions are doing with technology right now? What, I mean, I haven't heard any specific, you know, this, the Catholic Church is doing this or the, uh, who, what churches are doing what, technologically speaking. Well, thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> this is a big question. I would, well, um, thinking of the previous question on, you know, or, or orthodox resources, and well, the, 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 the variable of the country is very relevant, and that's, that, that's the point. You have, of course, uh, cross-country religious resources, but very often the, 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 the issue is, is then contextualized in, in, in one specific country, and of course, there again, you have religious traditions with a much stronger global, uh, a global profile, and others with a very strong uh, uh, local, local specificity. And, the, and, and I think that methodologically, your, your, your question would need to be asked in, in, in this framework, because it's uh, not, necessarily, uh, there's not necessarily one question fits all, uh, especially when it comes to you know, some, but if, even in, in global religious communities like the Catholic Church, you might have you might have local episcopates more active, and stressing different aspects. And uh, well, the German Church has been ve very active in that in, in that regard, and uh, not so much in other contexts. Um, so methodologically, that that should be very much contextualized in terms of. Um, of, of, of a response. We, we published at Fondazione Bruno Kessler a, a report on the response of uh, um, European religious actors to the consultation promoted by the EU Commission on uh, the white paper on artificial intelligence. And it's, it's quite interesting to see how the different religious actors took part in their, in their conversation and similarities. So if you want to know more in that regard, please visit the website of Fondazione Bruno Caster Religious Studies and you, you will have a comparative report about how, especially, you know, churches, the, 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 the ECADE was one of those and, and, and the, the Catholic Comesse and the Orthodox and Protestant uh, Keck reacted and, and, and took part in a conversation of artificial intelligence, many other examples. I remember Pasquale studying the Baptist, uh, one, one Baptist response to, to the debate on AI. But in, in general, it's not, you know, the, 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 this, there's a lot to be done also in terms of uh, uh, identifying resources, identifying what has been done. Just to add one thing to that, uh, uh, for sure there is this mapping that also FPK has tried to do, so how, because the main question here would be, sorry for picking on concepts and asking specification on concepts, but uh, it's, it's my role probably. Uh, we, we would agree, we, I mean, we would need to agree on what religion means and uh, who is a religious actor, because uh, this is one side of the picture. The other side of the picture, which I have seen over the past few years, I read a book on uh, the changing anthropology of Silicon Valley and how that affects the development of technology. Now, if you read that, you would not classify that those things as under the religion label that we have used for centuries, basically. But there is a, a silver line of developing a religion there. Uh, as FBK would call it the religion of innovation or a new religion, so a new humanism. Uh, call it how you, whatever you want. So there is a basically uh, an understanding of human nature vis-a-vis -vis technology, which is totally re reshifting and you know redesigning the approach of how humans relate to technology. Uh, and that is also part of the equation, I think. That, that big anthropological change. <laughs> 
If, if I may, uh, uh, yes, I know that uh, speaking in general of religions can be very vague, but still I would like to uh, uh, insist on the potentiality by evoking another treaty. Uh, Professor Geraci was mentioning the uh, non-proliferation treaty. Uh, well, we know that the OEC has supported very strongly in collaboration with other faith and other big and uh, important treaty, the treaty of the prohibition of nuclear weapons, which is very controversial and uh, uh, especially because, as we all know, has made, uh, has been approved and it came into force uh, without the collaboration, without even the participation of the states that hold nuclear weapons. So I think, uh, uh, coming back to the previous questions, first of all, what the religion thinks or even what religions are. Uh, but after that, if they come to an agreement on what they can do on something specifically, uh, are the states ready to collaborate uh, really? Uh, there is much space for pessimism. But still, I, I still believe that we, we, we need to insist because, for example, if we think uh, uh, correctly to that, we know that uh, we have certain states, I think that now are 55, that have joined the Treaty on the Prohibition. Uh, it's, it's a huge number. We don't have the ones that possess nuclear weapons, but inside the public opinion of the states, the, the, the pressure is mounting. And, and that is where we are called to act in generating public awareness, because it's not true when we say, we know that war doesn't war nuclear weapons. Well, in, theoretical, in, in gen very generic terms, this is true. But we need to reach real people. We need really to come uh, and conquer maybe one by one on the importance of integral peace, of integral de development, and integral security. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just say a few words. Um, Pasquale mentioned or asked me before what, what I meant by partnerships, and you're right, it's a very broad, very general term, but it's used like that in the literature and in policy documents, grey literature, you find partnerships meaning collaborations of all sorts. Um, so, but anyway, going back to, to how partnerships meaning collaborations between faith actors or religious actors. There's also that debate, is it faith, is it religion? <laughs> it's a very, very difficult question. But um, going back to how coalitions can be made among um, religious actors or between religious actors and other stakeholders, NGOs, other actors, that businesses that might be have similar interests or motivations. Um, and you made the example of the EU border. So the EU says, oh, civil society, tell us what you think about uh, ethics and AI, or oh, religious actors, we're interested, we're in consultations with you. But then they, what they do at the border is something completely different. No? So, and, and that's when holding the institutions into account comes in, I think. So how do religious actors react to such, such contradictions and, and, and how do they build partnerships or do they, um, collaborate or build alliances with other actor, actors to um, tackle or, 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 or expose those those contradictions. Um, and then, yeah, just one very brief thing. Yes, this is a reactive um, um, side of, of religious engagement, but the proactive side is there. It's I think it's really less visible and maybe also um, somehow smaller in size or in, in visibility, but it is there. There, are the, some examples in humanitarian actions I've, I've given before, but there are other tiny, tiny examples that come up. Uh, but there's a lot of mapping to do, a lot of mapping and and, and looking out for. But thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 7 p.m. Uh, fast approaching. We have agreed uh, beforehand that uh, the concluding remarks belong to Robert. That's your burden, <laughs> responsibility. Robert, please help us um, uh, find some conclusions. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure we agreed on that so much as that's just what the piece of paper said. And so uh, <laughs> that's, that's where we find ourselves. Um, you know, it is an honor to speak to the community today, to share the venue with my colleagues near and far. Uh, I do want to thank real quickly everyone participating today, Marco and Branca and Pasquale and Susana and Alessio and Jim, uh, and of course, all the experts in AI robotics and the study of science and technology 
who met with us over the past few months and our, our audience, I think what we are seeing is that we do understand that there are shared goals to promote human well-being um, that bring us together in our consideration of AI. Uh, we do have questions about what the role of religion might be in there. What are religious groups doing? This is an important kind of question, right? It goes back to the way in which people are being trained to think both as leaders within religious traditions and as lay people within religious traditions. Um, how are they going to think about these technologies and how are they going to get involved? Because all too often, has, as has been noted today, people are reactive. We're finding that a technology gets created and then we go, oh, what should we do? Uh, and we need to get much more thoughtful about what technologies we want to create and how we want to create them. You know, from the early days of AI, theorists have known that these are technologies of control. That's what cybernetics is. It's the study of control in systems, in people, and in machines. So if we, ha we haven't yet learned to relinquish our goal of controlling one another, and so from military to public policy, AI is threatening this relentless pursuit of what, what I call efficiency. It cannot do anything but go wrong if it omits more humane goals. The global competition that people spoke about earlier, this is not the answer for humanity. To have a nation by nation struggle for who can develop the best AI weapons the quickest, the best AI surveillance the quickest. These modes of profit making and social control, those are similarly not the answer. Our, po our, our policy brief, which, you know, as Marco mentioned earlier, uh, will be publicly available. It suggests concrete domains where we can get involved from religious perspectives and from political perspectives. And so I invite you to consider how your community can join us in developing healthy and human centered goals, regulations and policies. Um, this is an opportunity for us to grow together as, as one world with our technologies serving the goal of bringing us into community with one another. Because if there's anything that these digital technologies are doing effectively, it is connecting people to one another. But sometimes those connections are not positive. And so what we need to do is engage to promote safety, fairness, accountability, and community. The future is an open one. And as Branka mentioned several times, people have this deterministic sense, like technology A will produce B, will produce C, will produce D. That's not true. The history of technology shows clearly that human beings and accident intervene regularly. And so the future is open and we have a role in making. And a world that's open is a world that has mystery in it and even monsters, but it's also a world in which there's hope. I hope that the G20 nations, the Interfaith Forum, can be leaders in that kind of a shared vision of working together. And on behalf of everyone who's participated in our deliberations, thank you for your attention today. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. Many thanks to Shire for hosting us, this unique and prestigious institution. So we're very grateful. See you uh, tomorrow for those of you who will continue uh, participating in the G20 Interfaith and enjoy your evening. And thank you very much.